Okay. Okay, good afternoon. So welcome everyone to this uh, new edition of the Eighteen Cell Seminar of CSL Paris. Uh, today is March the 10th and we have the pleasure to host Vittoria Colizza with us today uh, from INSERM in Paris. So I guess Vittoria doesn't need I mean, an introduction because she's so she got so famous in the last uh, in the last year. I mean, due to I mean the global situation we are all experiencing. But just a few words, just to 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 frame. I mean, how Victoria got here. So Victoria is a physicist. She got a degree originally from Sapienza University, Rome. And I I seem to remember I know someone you work with at Sapienza. And then she and then she moved to 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 Trieste at the International School for Advanced Studies, CISA. She got a PhD there before moving abroad, before in the in the US, and then back to Italy, I guess, in Turin ISI Foundation with their ERC ERC grant. And then I guess since uh, 10 years, so 2011 or 12, I don't remember, um, she joined the INSERM in Paris, and then she developed this uh, this wonderful team. Uh, working with her right now uh, and working, I mean, of course, at the scientific level, but more and more at the interface between science and policy. And now I guess she's really consulting a lot of policymakers and stakeholders on COVID related matters. And uh, so I would say without further ado, I mean, I will let the floor to leave the floor to, to Victoria. And I guess will be a lot of questions at the end. So I think it's important to leave room also for many questions at the end. Thanks a lot, Victoria, for accepting the invitation and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Victoria, for this kind of introduction, for the invitation, also for the patience in rescheduling this once. And uh, thanks everybody for joining. I'm actually happy that I'm not screen sharing so that I can check, uh, keep an eye on my time, because it's always awful when uh, on, on this conversation, these talks I'm not used to, uh, yet on keeping time on uh, when I when I zoom uh, my talks. So I I'll start from one of your okay and and. Y you let me know if something does <laughs> I think... Uh, nothing is moving. Nothing is moving and I think I need, uh, yes, to keep the slides on my side, otherwise I cannot move between the slides apparently. It's okay, it's okay. So you'll have a preview. Um, okay, I'll start from, uh, let's say, some of, of the end of, uh, of, of your presentation. I start from my amazing team and I really need to thank them and I always do it at the very start of the meeting uh, of, the, of the presentation. And, uh, and, and this is really extraordinary in the sense that it's not the usual thank. Uh, these are all very young members uh, of the lab who have been working uh, incessantly for now over, the, over one year. Uh, Giulia Pullano sent uh, a reminder last year when we, a few, few weeks ago, when we celebrated the first, uh, uh, let's say, the first paper on, uh, on the pandemic that was the uh, end of January 2020. So it's been more than one year. I'm very happy also to include the two new members. Uh, and I also take advantage of this to advertise that we have uh, open position. Then, of course, uh, a list of uh, um, thousand other collaborators and some of the work I, I wanted also to highlight from the start is some of the work that we did uh, helped uh, in, into the management of this crisis. Uh, and specifically, we, we work a lot with Santé Pouli France since the very beginning with the APHP. Uh, hospitals of Paris, uh, the Ministry of Health, but we also worked, for example, for uh, the um, uh, Secretary of State for the digital uh, um, for the digital in uh, in in France for for the app. So some of the things that I'm I'm not going to touch in this talk. Um, so just to settle the frame. Uh, what we do is to use tools of uh, statistical, mathematical, computational epidemiology um, mixed with digital epidemiology in order to provide, uh, to track infectious disease outbreaks, uh, to better prepare for uh, events of this type. And then, of course, when pandemic events happen, uh, to be able to respond. And in terms of, uh, of of approaches we have uh, developed over the years, uh, a really wide range of approaches. So some of them are somehow classic from the mathematical epidemiology, for example, uh, uh, mixing, mixing stratified by age. Some of them include space, matter population approaches. Um, some of them push more towards instead the agent-based resolution. Um, 
reproducing synthetically population and so having also the structure like uh, workplaces, schools, uh, homes, uh, because they may be important to understand some of the dynamics and the, uh, most specifically the response. And then pushing this further also in terms of content network approaches where we have really an information of uh, context of between individuals and how this can evolve in time. Now my, ah, okay, of course I have huh, uh, hidden uh, slides. Uh, this gets more and more complicated. <laughs> So um, let's say two of, my, of the staples of, uh, of my work before COVID-19 pandemic were using space and using mobility. Uh, so metapopulation approach is where you have your population divided in different uh, areas in the world and where you take into account not only of the dynamics of the epidemic evolving in each of these, uh, for example, cities, but also taking into account of how mobility helps uh, and shape the propagation, geographic propagation of the, of the epidemic uh, in space. Now then uh, pandemic happened and, uh, and somehow we started our first uh, uh, studies where really into, into this aspect. So looking at mobility and looking at how mobility uh, was shaping the very first phase. So that is whenever you have an emerging disease, it's a, it's a phenomenon of importation. So the invasion of the disease throughout the globe. Here I'm showing as a reference the number of cases. I'm just stopping it in the month of September in order to have a zoom, let's say, on the first wave that, that will be, let's say, the first part of my talk. And what we do, what we did at the very beginning was uh, once the uh, epidemic emerged in China, uh, it was mid-January when, uh, uh, let's say, I decided to, to, to move and, uh, and work on COVID. And I knew from prior experience that either you go full or, or you're not able really uh, to do outbreak response in real time. And so I, we decided from one day to, to, to the next uh, to move all resources and everybody in the lab also if they were doing different projects uh, to move towards uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And the first works we did uh, were on COVID-19 importation risk. Uh, clearly in terms of, uh, so having a European perspective, we were interested in understanding the chances of getting importations and also how these were changing depending on the connection, direct or even transfer, between countries in, uh, in Europe and the origin of the outbreak that was in China. And just to, what I, what I like to do in this talk is really to have a, a, a retrospective view of everything that happened, but trying to immerse you uh, into, into the situation at that time. We had very few data on, uh, on the situation in China. We, had, we could count only on a couple of other importations in other countries in the world. And just to give you the, the let's say, the uh, hidden part of the story, before this first paper on your surveillance, uh, we probably trashed uh, two, three reports that we started doing uh, in the morning and by the end of the day, they were already outdated because things were evolving so fast. And then by the time we submitted this paper to your surveillance as a rapid communication, so something that is evaluated very rapidly, um, we had anyway basically to do two papers, two different papers, because by the time we got the revisions, a lot of things have changed, and specifically uh, France and Germany had the first importation. Our study at that time highlighted uh, these five countries so th that were at highest risk of importation uh, from China, UK, Germany, France, Italy, and Spain. And with the exception of Germany, that probably managed very well the contact tracing at the very beginning, all the other countries suffered a very bad first wave due to the propagation of, uh, of, uh, of the disease, the silent propagation of the epidemic before then the very first alert happened in Italy at the end of February. One aspect of, uh, that, that we looked at was instead in Africa, just to give you again a different perspective uh, um, clearly resources uh, differ country by country and our interest into Africa was more into trying to understand how local resources could handle importation. So we ranked uh, again countries by risk of importation and we uh, associated 
this risk of importation in, with the capacity of each country, capacity to respond, for example, to epidemics or so specific to health, but also capacity in terms of um, elements that they had at disposal, like uh, number of beds, uh, also situation of the country, political stability of the country, um, and uh, uh, GDP of the country. And looking at that, we highlighted some of the countries that were at highest risk and that probably could respond to the importation and in the middle instead a range of countries which were at medium to high risk and that were kind of uh, uh, instead suffering in terms of resources. And this was an important work because soon after uh, the WHO declared uh, the, pan the, the now pandemic uh, um, in, of international concern, so an event of international concern, and that is a moment in which then resources can be um, uh, delivered and can be put in place and shipped to specific countries. And we had added, for example, at that time, there were only two labs who can, could process tests in the entire continent, and this increasingly um, uh, changed over time. But then, of course, importation has also another meaning, that is to look at importation and uh, over, over the globe, and then look at how reducing uh, travel could help containment. Now, this is a question that has been asked uh, in scientific terms uh, over and over again, and it's, uh, there is, let's say, a resurrection of this uh, question every time there is an emerging disease. And also recently, for example, you'll, you witnessed that when there was the emergent the alert on the variant in the UK, that countries decided to, uh, to take action in that respect. And in the past, what we saw was more of a spontaneous adaptation of individuals and not traveling to the destination because it was the source of an ongoing outbreak. This happened for SARS, it happened also in 2009. Large drops, about 40% drops, large for that time, of course, compared to now, but also the spontaneous adaptation changed and were reabsorbed uh, very rapidly in the, in the time frame of one, two, three months. Then with the Ebola epidemic, we started uh, instead having something that more probably was closely anticipating what we could uh, uh, expect for the next pandemic. That was some authorities deciding uh, really to implement uh, restrictions. For example, countries in Africa decided to close their border. This was uh, an unprecedented measure uh, in, in modern time. And also some uh, airplane uh, companies decided not to fly to the affected area anymore. And what we know from a huge amount of studies that were conducted, especially in preparation for a pandemic flu, but also then retrospectively analyzing what happened with the uh, 2009 pandemic, what happened with this specific emergency of Ebola and the travel restrictions, all these studies show that these restrictions, and in the key word here is feasible travel restrictions, uh, only lead to a delay. Now, this delay is not of months, is at most of weeks. And so, yes, of course, can help into preparing better, for example, a surveillance system or preparing a surveillance at the airport, but clearly has nothing to do with containment. And the reason to, to, for that, uh, behind that, is a simple uh, mathematical reason. We are trying, the idea is to contain a process that increases exponentially with a linear reduction of the number of exportation. And if uh, uh, you have an epidemic at the source that increases exponentially because it's emerging and finds a lot of susceptible uh, in, uh, um, to, to, to infect, uh, then also exportations will increase exponentially. And so travel restrictions uh, will only bring a delay to that. But then as, uh, let's say, complex uh, uh, complexity scientists, uh, uh, we wanted also to look whether there was a threshold effect. And here I'm uh, just flashing some very old work that we did uh, uh, well in advance of, uh, of uh, for example, the flu pandemic in 2009, in which we showed that in terms of metapopulation, there is indeed a threshold that is a threshold for invasion. It means that if you have your uh, epidemic emerging in a single place, then there is a certain probability that this epidemic can jump out of this place, thanks to mobility, and then touch other territories that were unaffected by the epidemic at, up to that point. And this uh, threshold depends on mobility, and this is easy, of course, to understand, and this is what 
pushes common sense to think that if we restrict mobility, we contain an epidemic, but it also depends on topology. And if we look at specifically at topology now with a very, uh, let's say, simple and uh, basic visualization, you have this uh, phase space uh, in terms of travel flow. If you are above a certain threshold, you will have inevitably invasion. And if you are below a certain threshold, instead you will have containment. And if in that equation of the of this invasion threshold, you plug in all the numbers and statistics taken from the real data and also from uh, diseases, infectious diseases that we had in the past and more recent, then you realize that you would need more than 99% of travel reduction in order to go from an invasion uh, situation to a containment one. And this changes a lot depending on the structure of the airline uh, transportation network. And given the structure that we have that is uh, composed of hubs, which allow us to, to travel from one part allowed us to travel from one part of the uh, globe to the next, thanks to the air travel. Uh, this also provides, of course, a very efficient mean for the viruses to invade um, different territories. If instead we had a, a, an organization of the air travel structure in terms of, for example, airport having more or less the same number of connections all over the place, then we would have a much harder time in, in terms of traveling from one place to the, to, to the other of the globe because we would need to do many more steps but at the same time uh, of course uh, this would be more much more easily to contain and so given this percentage and all the simulations that we had uh, that that is uh, the, the, the let's say the recommendation behind the statement behind feasible travel restrictions uh, would not help in containing the epidemic but then COVID-19 happened, and what we witnessed is that many, many different countries decided to completely shut down flights, and the first was really the province of the airport of one, then the province, and then the entire China. Uh, with reductions in terms of uh, travelers uh, uh, all over the world, uh, which were extraordinary, that were never achieved, uh, such reductions were never achieved in the past, and then continue to exist, of course, also today. Uh, and then something else, we know that mathematically these travel restrictions would not work unless you push them to 100% and unless you implement something else that is a local lockdown so some or, or other social distancing measures that are able to suppress the exponential increase. So once you couple the two, then plenty of studies have shown that these are extremely important in uh, uh, controlling the epidemic. But then all of these uh, need to be also coordinated. It was the month of February when we were trying to understand the effect of the travel restrictions put in place in the province of Wuhan. And uh, by reconstructing the history of uh, uh, about 300 cases exported all over the globe, we, of course, we found that that travel ban was extremely e efficient in stopping exportation. Um, and also we predicted that this could stay, these exportations could stay low for a certain amount of time and then slightly increase. What happened in reality is that many other countries had, um, uh, had gotten importations. Uh, there were silent epidemics uh, instead spreading in those countries. And so they started behaving as new sources uh, of exportations around the world. And notably, these were Iran and Italy at the very beginning in this phase of the pandemic towards the end of February, before then other countries as well. Um, so this to say that in some sense, something that has been a stable of, uh, of control so far, uh, and also the need to maintain uh, travel in order to also provide resources, provide the medical personnel uh, to the affected area, may probably be, be revised uh, in the near future. And we need to, to, to understand what could happen since uh, we pushed our control measures to the absolute uh, uh, boundaries and extremes that were unthinkable before in terms of zero travel and also in terms of basically of zero social activity through the lockdowns. So this was the situation in which we were at the end of February. Clearly, there was the first alert in Europe given by the epidemic that was suddenly discovered in Italy. And uh, in the meantime, we had been working the entire month of February to uh, 
try to parameterize our models uh, in order to understand what was the situation in, in France. We knew that a lot of importations uh, were not detected. We were estimated that, that six out of 10 importations were not detecting uh, um, in, by, by countries. And so this inevitably could have led to ongoing transmission, onward transmission on the territory. So we were preparing for then what later happened, first in Italy and the rest of the countries. And in that situation, the very first questions that, and it's a very difficult one in absence of data, is at what stage of the epidemic are we? Are we at the very beginning? Are we instead at, uh, I don't know, half of the height towards the peak? Are we already close to the peak and we didn't realize? And the way to, to look at that is, of course, to understand what kind of data you have. So on the left, and sorry, but this was meant to be an animation in order to explain better. So I will need to do some that in a different way. On the left, you have the components of our model. We had the models ready, models that are spatially based, integrating different levels of mobility, because we wanted, of course, to trace how this epidemic was going to propagate over the, in, on, on the French territory. We also have uh, age classes. So we were ready to incorporate that. At the time, we had no idea of, at of the risk factors by age classes yet. Uh, we also had information on contacts, on week, weekend, regular days, holidays, etc. So plenty of information. The model was extremely detailed and powerful and rich. On the other hand, we were lacking data from a surveillance point of view uh, in terms of COVID. And, and in France, we were actually lucky in the sense that by the end of February, we were already seeing an increase in the ILI incidents, ILI is influenza-like illness. So this is a, a surveillance that is uh, monitored, historically monitored in many, uh, in many countries. And in France, in some regions, which ended up then being the, the, heat, the largest uh, heat uh, region, Haute-de-France and Ile-de-France, which are the ones highlighted, uh, those regions were already showing an increase. Now, this increase in 35 years of surveillance was never observed in terms uh, of uh, influenza only. And so, of course, we suspected that this was already a signal of uh, COVID circulating on the territory and we used the statistical approaches to disentangle the two signals so influenza on one side which was supposed to continue decreasing and then an increasing uh, value for uh, COVID but of course this is not enough to, to parameterize uh, such a model and at the same time things were evolving just too fast uh, I think this is a brilliant and very simple visualization showing the number of countries that have been uh, reported as, as infected. So, of course, also with all the delays in reporting and all the possible biases in identifying uh, importations. And nonetheless, it shows very clearly that the increase of, uh, in, of this number of countries was, uh, it was extremely steep and rapid compared to previous pandemic. And once you have to, to work in, in outbreak response in real time, you always have, especially at the beginning, you're dealing with very few poor data, if non-existing data. Uh, you have to deal with a lot of different assumptions. Uh, knowledge is evolving rapidly, but too slowly for, what, for your need. And anyway, changing basically the, the, the landscape within which you, you're building these models. Resources are inevitably scarce. Uh, and talking about resources in my group, I had uh, PhD students who just arrived and who were just starting their work in epidemic modeling. And of course, they none of them had a training in outbreak response and none of them had ever been exposed to such uh, type of work, which is very different from, uh, um, let's say, routine uh, scientific research, what we generally call in peacetime. Uh, then, of course, there is a lot of work in data interpretation, in communication. And so what we ended up doing, and well, this was probably the only simple animation, is that we had to drop the metapopulation standards because considering space uh, it required us to, uh, to handle too much information that we couldn't parameterize and fit also, calibrate to the data easily in real time. We use mobility. But at the very beginning, we used mobility mostly as a covariate to inform, uh, inform contacts. 
and then we had to go settle down on much more basic approaches, which are the age stratified approach. So contact matrices became the real superstar in uh, in modeling COVID nineteen. And talking again about data, I think that here a, a bit of, uh, of, of, let's say, of a pause uh, really needs to, to be made, uh, especially if you want to take out some lessons of what we experienced in the last year. We've been talking about big data for about 10 years, and we found ourselves completely unprepared for what uh, we were going to face. Uh, on the left, I'm, I'm showing the um, daily admissions to hospital registered in Ile-de-France. Uh, over the, the first month, over, over the month of March. And uh, on 17th of March, there was the lockdown implemented in, uh, in France. And just so you know, this database became operational just a couple of days before France entered lockdown. And so all the data that you see before this error were reconstructed, uh, were, were just built and, uh, and inputted uh, in a retrospective way with all the possible problems that you can imagine of classification, of taking this data uh, during an emergency, an emergency that we don't know yet. And so, uh, and on the other hand, this brief amount of data, basically the ones that you see, for example, in, uh, in uh, black, are the only data we have in France in order to estimate uh, the reproductive number of, uh, of COVID-19. And this situation was very similar ac across other countries. And just one other element, we were able to do that because there was an existing database called the CIVIC, which, is, which was built after the terrorist attacks of 2015 uh, to trace uh, over time terrorist victims. And just because we had that infrastructure that we were able to adapt it, and this is continues to be used, is exactly the same infrastructure, it's still called in that way, uh, for for terrorist uh, terrorism victims unit, um, uh, victims, sorry, uh, persons. And, uh, and this is still what we're using today. Um, in other countries, of course, they, they struggled in, in different ways. Other countries never released one year and a few months after the, the first alert, still are not releasing these admission to the hospital data, which are among the most robust uh, data that we can use to, to monitor the epidemic. And then something else, uh, something that is really uh, static data, very small data that enter in a in few lines of an Excel, which was simply the number of ICU beds. And we didn't have those as well. Uh, and again, talking with other colleagues in other countries, they were struggling exactly with the same problem. The latest publication available was dated 2012, and there were no statistics on Eurostat that could provide these critical bad care bed numbers which was where so much needed. And, and then something else, when you, you want to do operational response and you, let's say, you find yourself, it's the beginning of April, so we are more or less over here. Uh, and this is really the situation you see. And I wanted to keep uh, the plot just partially showing the, the dots because it's always easy to understand what's happened if you have the full trajectory. But if you're in the middle of, of the lockdown, it's about two, three weeks, four, almost uh, over three weeks and uh, lockdown has been implemented. And you start to see that, of course, something is happening. You don't see descent yet. You see just a, a cloud of points. But, of course, the good aspect is that this somehow has been stopped. So the, the, uh, this crazy increase has been stopped. And now you, you, you start wondering whether it will decrease and with what speed it will decrease. And we needed, we wanted to provide the early estimate of the impact of, uh, of the lockdown. And clearly we are in a situation where we cannot use contact data collected prior to the pandemic uh, because contacts have been completely disrupted. And so we need to, to do something else. And what we thought was to uh, mechanistically reconstruct these contacts. Uh, so we knew that schools were closed. So uh, these contact matrices have information on contacts at home, at school, at workplace, uh, on transport, doing leisure activities and other activities, whether these contacts are physical or only conversational. So there is plenty of information, but of course, refer to a situation that is in peacetime. What we did was to 
take this information and try to reproduce synthetically something that was more closely resembling what was happening in real life. And uh, of course, this can be done up to a certain extent. It's easy to do for schools that were closed. It's, e it's easy to do for all the other activities that were closed. One can make the hypothesis that physical contacts outside home were not, uh, were, were not occurring anymore due to recommendation. But the big question was, how many people are staying at home? And in order to respond to the question, we used uh, mobility data. Now, mobility data have been used, especially cell phone coming from cell phone data, have been used in the past years in several different emergencies. And, but let's say, never at the point of, uh, of the, the point reached uh, uh, during the COVID pandemic. And, and this uh, element was so strong that also other um, companies beyond uh, telcos decided to make this data available. And now everybody, of course, knows and uses uh, Google data um, that differentiates, uh, for example, presence in different places, and it's extremely uh, rich and powerful. Imagine that many governments do not have access to this data, cannot have access, uh, not even to telcos data. And so these are uh, these data, e even if uh, um, uh, even if just restricted to certain number of uh, of places, are already a, an important uh, perspective on what is happening. So we looked at how mobility was changing over the first lockdown. We looked at several different aspects, whether by space, by age, whether we see we saw a different behavior by age, and generally we didn't, except for very long trips. We saw that mobility, the range of mobility had restricted very strongly, but at the same time, mobility across the distant places were not going to zero. This, once again, is a lesson for uh, importations. So even under a lockdown with rigid measures uh, um, against the travel between regions, we did observe um, sort of movements. And then we also looked at the fact that not only there was this restriction, but these restrictions were different region by region. There were some regions which were able to achieve larger reductions of mobility compared to other. And we highlighted that this was depending on specific socioeconomic indicators uh, that could be, for example, the labor sectors uh, that is mostly prevalent in, uh, in one region compared to another. For example, in, Paris, in the region of Paris, a lot of tourism, a lot of uh, uh, professional uh, sectors linked to, for example, to events, uh, restaurants, uh, catering, uh, trips, uh, uh, visits, museum, theaters, etc. So all of this was closed and then brought a larger reduction in these regions. We also hypothesized the possible risk aversion behavior because the regions that were mostly hit are also the ones that were more closely uh, following uh, probably recommendations because there was a, a, a continuous campaign of com communication uh, over the news. Of course, today, this is likely not happening anymore, but on the other hand, the Indi socioeconomic indicators are still uh, important and we saw them also on the second lockdown that happened in November and then currently in the curfew. So that explained the disparities at the regional and also departmental level. And so going back to our problem at the time, we looked at this mobility data and given that basically everything else was closed except essential services, we used the, the reduction of mobility as a proxy for the number of people who were at home. Uh, because they were not moving. And the hypothesis was that those who were moving were only those who were uh, doing essential services. And again, we wanted to provide the early assessment of this impact of lockdown. And it seems one month after the start of lockdown, it seems a huge amount of time, but three weeks after we were still at this place. So we couldn't estimate that from the data. So we used our uh, synthetically reconstructed matrices and we provide some uh, information on the lockdown. And we estimated also the reproductive numbers that were associated to, to COVID-19 and what was the reduction that was about 70 to 80% reduction during the lockdown um, uh, of, of this reproductive number.
So we predicted that effectively this curve was going to be decreased and also we predicted what was the number of ICU beds occupied over time, uh, requiring for Ile de France an increase of up to about three times the capacity, the original capacity of uh, ICU in the, in the hospitals of the region. This is really huge and nowadays we are struggling once again. We have passed 90% capacity of, uh, of the original, uh, uh, let's say, number of, of beds and there are, there are uh, nowadays, uh, let's say, a lot of debate about increasing this number or putting some measures to bring these numbers down. Now, we, we also could understand some interesting fact. Uh, a, a posteriori, this was done uh, during the revision. The fact that we hypothesized that, that uh, uh, people avoided physical contacts when they were not uh, um, when they were not at home was later confirmed by large-scale surveys on the use of preventive measures by individuals that were conduct conducted by Santé Police France and showed that more than 90% 90 90 of people were doing that during the, the lockdown. With physical contact, the curve would have been completely different, uh, higher and with a longer duration. Uh, and also we could compare our lockdown uh, with some preliminary estimates coming from China and then from the UK and showing that indeed we were in the middle. We, we estimated about 80% contact reduction. In China, it was estimated to be 90%. In the UK, about 73%. And so in China, effectively, we know that the lockdown was completely different and much more rigid and strict with respect to what we did. And if we did something along those lines, we would have uh, a, 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 a smaller peak in terms of ICU beds occupied and also a, a return to, to, to uh, manageable situation in a faster way. And instead, what happened in the UK was once again something that was similar to what we predicted. So a higher peak and especially a longer one. So something that remained on a plateau for a long time before going down. And then there was the phase three, let's say this was the, the part that we did during the lockdown. And, but at a certain point, you also need to understand, okay, how do we go out of, of this? And the very first analysis that we made that were horrifying because clearly given the contagiousness of the virus and given the fact that you had a huge pool of susceptible that were still available, um, this once again, was, it was possible to estimate that thanks to the hospitalization data and thanks to some understanding of what was the hospitalization ratio, so the probability that a person infected with the virus could go to the hospital. Otherwise, it's, uh, it remains the big question of where do we stand in this epidemic? Have we infected enough people? We were not testing, and so we had no idea what was the number of the people infected during the first wave, except for the modeling. And so based on that, we started to think about, okay, but then how do we exit from this lockdown? Because if we leave everything like that, then we are, uh, uh, we are probably expecting another wave that can be, of course, uh, much higher than the first, which was suppressed by the lockdown. And so what we did uh, was was to uh, realize uh, that uh, we needed to test, the trace, and isolate. And once again, to, to try to, to, to put back uh, the, uh, the situation in which, that we were living. At that time, in, uh, at, at the parliament, on the news, uh, um, testing was uh, presented, uh, pre presented as an exclusive mean to, uh, for symptomatic individuals uh, and not for people, other individuals who were either pre-symptomatic, asymptomatic or contacts of uh, symptomatic cases. So it was exclusively used to test the symptomatic individuals. And then mainly because we were in a situation under emergency, it was used just for people entering the hospital to understand whether they had COVID or not. And typically symptoms were already enough to show that. And, and, and for us, the thing that was really dramatic at a certain point. So first of all was the estimate of our not. We had preliminary estimate from China, a lot of fantastic papers published in Science, Nature, Lancet, etc., that were estimating that our not was between 2 and 2.5. And then we estimated our reproductive number in our data and we found 3. And, and the most, uh, and let's say that the very big difference between these two estimates is that with a, a reproductive number around 2, 2.5, and there were already papers on uh, Lancet that were showing that, well, you can deal with social distancing uh, to manage the epidemic, and that's going to be probably enough. But with three, 
that's that's not possible. With three, what we showed is that exiting lockdown, even with very strict measures in which all activities are completely closed, we would still get a second wave that could achieve twice as much the capacity of the health system. And so it was not possible. So it was in that occasion that we realized that test, trace, and isolate uh, was, uh, was, was fundamental, was critical to, to, to aid in the management of the pandemic. Otherwise, we could not. And so we sent this, uh, this paper. This was still the paper in the middle of uh, April to, to authorities uh, in order to highlight that not only we need to test it, to test, but also we need to test a lot. We, need to we needed to test basically more than 50% of cases. Otherwise, of course, a lot of possible scenarios could happen, but for sure, uh, an increase of cases was to be expected. And I'm putting here on, on the left the figure that, that was part of the study in which we showed how we could use different strategies that could allow us to keep uh, an epidemic going down, or instead, if we were going to open partially, then we would have we would have had an increase of cases uh, in uh, starting uh, August already. And this is exactly what happened. And and then once again, if you recollect, in the month of September, in the month of October, when finally we started again talking about this increase of cases that we saw in the data already from uh, early August, uh, there were the statements on uh, well, this not even the models so were able to predict it, and, and and clearly this is a misunderstanding of the reality. Not only our model, but a lot of different models have predicted that second waves that were very likely to happen uh, because simply we we were probably didn't have the resources and also the the the. Uh, framework in order to test so massively as other countries were doing and then uh, counteract this increase. But then the question was uh, effectively, so how are we, t are we testing enough? And the, the strategy of the government changed before exiting this first lockdown, once realizing that this was an important uh, uh, aspect in the management of the epidemic, they implemented a new system, which is now called CDAP, that traces all cases ever uh, monitored, ever tested. Um, and, and in principle, this was to be exhaustive because those were the recommendations also of uh, WHO. And so what we did was to look at whether this was exactly the case. We had to go back to our models. Uh, there was a huge work uh, in, uh, in the data analysis and integration and model parameterization, because of course, if you want to get into that level of details and analyze retrospectively what have happened, uh, you need to integrate virological surveillance data, you need to uh, take into account that there are delays from onset to testing, that uh, you have information on asymptomatic and symptomatic individuals, but this can be classified wrongly. So you need to infer a lot of aspects. And then at the same time, in terms of your transmission model, you need to recreate once again the contacts of, of the society once we exited lockdown. And so for that, we used uh, the data from the Ministry of Education in terms of uh, uh, how many students were at school. Since schools were open, but pre physical presence at school was done on a voluntary basis. Uh, we also looked at how many people over time were going back to work, uh, thanks to Google data. We integrated data on, again, the use of uh, uh, preventive measures, and also consider that seniors were already using uh, a, a, a higher, um, a more protective behavior because they were clearly aware of their heightened risk. And once you do integrating all of this data, we were able to assess that in France, over the period in which this strategy, newly implemented strategy, was supposed to be testing uh, or in, in an exhaustive way uh, the cases, we were actually testing just one out of 10 cases. Uh, and of course, we got in some sense uh, lucky because the epidemic was going down and was going down for several reasons. So mostly because people we were progressively reopening and mostly because people were really uh, still afraid, just exiting the first lockdown. And so preventive measures uh, were um, respected um, and, and because clearly also of seasonal effects that helped along the way. We 
cross-checked how this data were compared, our predictions compared with the predictions obtained from participatory surveillance, where we had had a pool of about 7,000 individuals, and that we were asking about their symptoms on COVID. And we showed that we would reach the same estimates in terms of incidence only if all suspect cases for COVID would be tested. And, and clearly identifying what were the weaknesses of, of the process in terms of recommendation for people to get tested at the very first symptom and also awareness in the population that should go and get tested. And then I skip a, a bunch of this and I will just conclude with the, with the last uh, elements because somehow it's a, it's a story that goes back to, to, to the beginning of last year. Uh, last December, we got this alert about the new variant that was called the variant of concern, UK or British variant. Um, and, and immediately the reaction was, uh, well, let's close the borders once again. And then a few days after, of course, many countries were forced to reopen. Uh, and anyway, the, the, the variant was clearly already circulating in our territory. So first estimates uh, that were done uh, thanks to a genomic surveillance survey that was organized in France at the very beginning of the year uh, were still oscillating. And we provided the very first projection. It was our report was dated January 16, in which we looked at different possible evolution of the epidemic and how the new variant could contribute to a deterioration of the epidemic. And we saw that even according a different scenarios, then this variant would become dominant by the end of February and the beginning of March. And this, of course, was uh, quite scary, uh, was, uh, was purely projections in the sense that we were trying to understand what was happening. So we were using models really in their aim of understanding, of uncovering the unknown, what we cannot see. And uh, two months after, the situation is uh, basically the same, uh, what we um, envisioned uh, uh, at the very beginning. Uh, in, in France, uh, the, the dominance was uh, reached uh, by mid-February. Uh, in some other uh, regions, uh, it was reached before, for example, in Ile de France, because uh, the, um, the presence of the variant at the very beginning was, uh, uh, was larger. And instead, in other regions where instead the penetration of the variant was smaller, they, uh, they show a certain delay with respect to other regions. So we are in a situation in which there is a large geographical heterogeneity, um, and at the same time, we are in a situation in which the main message has not changed. Uh, there is uh, a, a problem of possible, okay, here I need to take out a few things because I don't have my animation. Okay, there was a problem of, of, of this variant that having an increase of transmissibility that is estimated in France about 60% of pushing uh, the, the, putting a lot of pressure on the, on the variant circulation and so increasing uh, uh, this push for, uh, for um, a, an increase of cases, uh, an increase of hospital admissions. What happened in France compared to other countries that adopted different strategies? So first of all, the, the curfew in the month of January really worked. And what we estimated last month was that the curfew anticipated at 6 p.m. was able to reduce the historical strain. Um, and this means that it's effective reproductive number going below one. And if you see and follow this line, this is the historical strain that is reducing over time. In other words, if we had exclusively the historical strain, then with a curfew today, we would be able to manage the epidemic even very successfully. But then we have also historical, the, the new variant. And despite these measures, the new variant continued to increase. And also despite the slowdown that was induced by the school holidays in France that suppressed even more variant circulation, and these continued to increase. So what we uh, project for the following week is that this situation may deteriorate pretty rapidly. And also, uh, despite the acceleration in vaccination that has been um, put in place, announced just uh, last week and put in place uh, starting this weekend. So even under very optimistic rollout uh, of uh, vaccines, we would find ourselves uh, in the month of uh, April that we, we may need to implement additional measures. Now, what measures? 
On the left, we have a situation like the second lo lockdown. So a mild lockdown in which schools are open, uh, there is the number people move twice as much as the first lockdown. So something that is about 15% uh, uh, more restrictive than current measures. Um, and then, of course, we always show something that is instead on the other side, so more pessimistic. What if instead we relax and we reopen something, given there is a lot of pressure from uh, several commercial sectors and uh, and from the economy to reopen? And this is unfortunately what we are, we, we are expecting. Now, this creates, uh, as, as you can imagine, a huge challenge into communicating this type of results to, to policymakers. And I think, uh, I let's say, I wanted to wrap up this at the very end of this slide. So we went from the travel ban and school closure a lot. We knew a lot from the past that was uh, in terms of pandemic flu that were expressed in terms of physical travel bans. And I think that now we have pushed this measure to, to, to some extent and to some uh, really extremes that we were not, we didn't think were achievable. That if tomorrow uh, there is a, a, another pandemic as severe as this one, as contagious as this one, probably uh, we need to anyway. In order for for us to prepare, we need to to revise uh, uh, the tools that we have at disposal. Uh, mobility was key. I think it was uh, the second uh, uh, superstar element uh, that helped uh, uh, modeling throughout this year. And this also helped a lot into opening, sharing, uh, providing new collaboration between science uh, and, uh, and companies. Clearly, there was a huge uh, weakness that is still existing in terms of data, data infrastructure. We still collect too uh, few of data, which would be instead extremely important. And somehow we need to revise uh, uh, countries that have the data culture, like the UK, are collecting a huge amount of data. And of course, this also helped them understand. It was just thanks to the data they collected that they were able to identify uh, the reason behind the increase of cases they were seeing in the month of November, December, and identify really the origin that was the variant. Um, surveillance systems are one, they play a key role in all of that. On one side, there is a problem of rigidity that whenever you change protocol, of course, it's hard to change protocols over time. And for our surveillance system, we change it at least three, four times over the last year. But then there are also issues with flexibility, because once you change your protocols, then your results, your data are not comparable anymore across uh, across different phases. So we need to think about other ways in order probably to make these uh, flexible, but at the same time um, usable uh, also for, for, for research. Then a vast lack of coordination, and I think this, of course, is, uh, is a key and is easy to understand uh, in terms of European countries. Um, I experienced, personally experienced uh, a huge dramas uh, in terms and difficulties in communications, uh, communication of uh, confidence intervals, communication of probabilities. Our first work on the risk of importation was highly politicized. Uh, and also was used uh, uh, in, in two opposite ways, either to show that there was no risk or to show that there was a large risk. And it was always the same study. Then, of course, this problem with the exponentials. Now we talk about them a lot, but still I think there is a misconception behind it. And, uh, and now it, exponential has become the synonym of rapid, but, but clearly it's, it's not the same. And we need to overcome this bias so that measures proportional to the situation do not happen. Measures should not be proportional to the current situation. Measures should be proportional if there is an exponential increase to the proportional to the situation that we're going to see at least in the next two or three weeks. And that's where models can help in providing somehow some tendencies. And the emergence of the variant was a, a, a big deja vu in the sense that we found ourselves once again exactly in the same situation one year after. We had the same problems of importations, we had the same problems of border closure, of uh, a difficulty in understanding what the addition of the variant could, uh, could 
signify in terms of possible exponential increases. And so far, the variants have exponentially increased. Now we have the data, so it's not only about the model. And then one last point, but since this is a scientific talk, so it's extremely important, funding, publishing, all of this was highly affected by the pandemic. And of course, while there are some positive aspects, there was some mobilization to, to provide accelerated funding, some many many reviews for example were interested of course in publishing uh, covid related studies well one year after this is of course uh, uh, far gone and uh, every almost for every paper that we published last year given that they were they were paper in outbreak response uh, we basically had to do at least two papers completely every revision was not a revision of the paper was redoing once again completely the study plus all the ones that, that I told you at the beginning just we tra were trashed immediately in the bin because they were outdated by, by the end of the day. And I think that with the variant, that this is exactly our, our story at the moment. So nothing has changed uh, in that respect. So some reflection on how to operate funding and also uh, academic papers, I think, needs to be done also for this set of, uh, for, for the field. And thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Victoria, for this very rich overview. Actually, a rewind from the last year. We all experienced, but I mean, through these pictures, I mean, it's interesting to see, I mean, what happened. So I guess there will be a few questions, but I'll start with one. So, I mean, first of all, a comment. I guess uh, you are suggesting that the new lockdown, I mean, should be in order in many countries in Europe for this variant and in particular for France, right? Which seems to go in a, a sort of different direction, at least for a while. Yeah, I think that you know a lot of people are ask me that question. I think uh, first of all, I would need to understand what is the objective of a government. And government didn't never declare the really their objective, except probably in France during the second lockdown. The objective was made very clear: five thousand infections was never achieved, and so objectives are not stated anymore. So. Uh, the situation at the moment is a situation if you talk with personnel in the hospital are extremely concerned uh, because we are running at more than 80 percent uh, sometimes more than 95 percent occupation of icu beds in certain regions also regions that have been severely hit in the first and second wave like ile de france so they have a large immunity but this immunity is nothing for for this virus yet and uh, and and so if you look at the situation we have today, well, clearly more restrictive measures could help already without the variant. So the right question is more, what, what is the objective? Shall we, are, are we okay with having 300 stats per day? Are we okay with having deprogrammation in the health system for other patients because we need to give priority and free beds for COVID-19 patients. And up to what point? So are we pushing this to the point of uh, impossible management? And so are we defining that as the urgency? I saw that in Europe, countries reacted in several different ways. There were the ones who had to deal with the increase of cases because they were facing that already. It was UK, Ireland, Spain, Portugal. And, and typically they put lockdown very severe, very strict. Then there were other countries like Germany and the Netherlands that implemented in a preventive way a lockdown in order to decrease cases and also taking advantage of the winter. So they started from the end of December. Now we are almost at three months, three full months uh, of, uh, of lockdown. And they are just talking now about reopening some of the things. And then there are countries that found themselves in a more favorable situation at the end of the holidays, for example, Italy and France. And if you see, Italy is already going towards more restrictive measures because they see this increase of cases. Mm -hmm. Now, in France, we were somehow favored, likely, at least this, this is uh, the outcome of our analysis, uh, by, by the school holidays that were also delayed over time geographically. And so this provided about four to five weeks of a slowdown. Uh, but we have already some departments who, are, who have seen these increases. And especially there is one aspect that hasn't been taken into account. We did it in this last uh, study, 
that not only is more transmissible, but the variant has also increased about 60% in the hospital admission. And so we will have a problem, if not now, in, in April, because we will start to feel also this increase in pressure in hospitalizations. Mm -hmm. So in, in terms of what we should do, it's always, uh, let's say, the answer is, uh, is in, the, in the objectives. But I think uh, I, I, I would not be surprised to see a deteriorating situation happening uh, soon enough uh, in different regions. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I would open the floor for questions from the audience. I know for sure there is a question from David. David. Yes, uh, just I was not sure to understand properly about what you said about uh, travel ban. Like I, I didn't got if it's not efficient to, except if you implement it at 100%, it's not efficient to get the invasion. Or is it just not enough? Like you need the travel ban plus other measures? You need you need both. So if, of course, let's say if you if you have a complete travel ban that is 100% and you implemented that very early, which is the hard thing to do because you need to recognize that there is an emergency. And typically, by the time you recognize that you have a cluster of respiratory infections in the market of one, you have already passengers that have flown out and brought the infection with them. But even if you're able to do that early, uh, all all the results show that it needs to be 100%. And so, of course, if it is 100% uh, uh, closure, so if you really um, avoid any, any, any travel out of your source, then inevitably, this is quite trivial, it stays within the source. But you need to couple for feasible, let's say, for, for the reality in which things are never so, uh, so strict, so you will always have a chance of somebody who fly out of the place, then you need to use also very restrictive measures. And the key for containment is that so far we have used mainly only suppressive measures like restrictive measures without playing a lot on the travel uh, in the past. And with this pandemic, if we had early coordination, so by the time, for example, there was the alert and we had the several different countries that were already infected, but we didn't have an explosion of cases yet, if by that time we closed the completely airports and, border, and borders and we implemented also restrictive measures, if we were testing, that's a one we had tests to do, that would be that would have been a totally different story. So my reflection is: uh, Is this going to change in the in the next future in the management of a pandemic emergency? But there is one key point that that make all of this very difficult: is the coordination. Unless you do in a coordinated way, if you stop all flights there, but you don't stop it there, and then you stop it but in a sort of avalanche mode, but you always have something that is active you're not going to stop it because the epidemic will just simply move to the places uh, uh, where it can move and then from there become a new seed. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you very much for your presentation. Thanks, David. I'm not sure there are other questions from the audience. So if not, I will have a question actually, uh, which is a more technical one. So if I, if I well understand, Vittoria, so in your simulations, you include the NPIs not explicitly, but through some, uh, um, I mean, evaluation of the input parameters, right? I mean, like you, you did for the for the mobility, for instance. So, so correct me if I'm wrong. So you're not explicitly uh, considering the specific NPI. So the reason why I'm asking is because at the beginning, in the first wave, the NPIs were basically taken at the national level, so very homogeneous. At the, at the national level. Now the situation is really scattered, it's scattered in space and time and, uh, and in, in, in space actually also at the, at the level of single village or single city actually. So it's very complicated to, to know I mean, what's happening. So uh, how do you deal with this uh, heterogeneity in the, in the NPI is taken? So there are, let's say, three sources. One is the mobility. Because the mobility, if I I'll, uh, I'll wish that because this is the source. Um, because mobility, even under the same restrictions, it, it's actually changing by regions. Uh, now here we were just going out of the lockdown, so we were not under restrictions. But the the the, the weeks before, 
show, would show exactly the same thing. You have a bunch of regions, all of them have the same trend, but mm -hmm. the values are different. And the Paris region, for example, is one that always has been detaching herself from the other regions. So one is in terms of how many people do smart working at home, which is given by, by the mobility. Another element uh, that is so introduced explicitly another and it's geographically based another element that for which we have only enough data at the national level is instead coming from the surveys on the use of preventive measures and for example we use how many people avoid physical contacts over time and this has been changing a bit over time but cannot explain geographical heterogeneities of course and then we are anyway forced to fit the model to admissions to hospital, because there will always be some elements that our models are not able to capture. Only specifically in this period, there was the exit from the first lockdown, and somehow retrospectively, we had a lot of, uh, let's say, knowledge of what was happening. Once you were fitting your model, we found that the matrices, so how we were informing uh, the matrices with this data, were kind of enough to explain the different uh, uh, geographies. Uh, otherwise, you will need an, ex an additional force that is implicitly in the fit. Okay, okay, no, very good. I guess this could be a very long discussion and perhaps at some point we will have this discussion. And, and so. Yes, and I think there is a lot of, of still that we haven't understood. So if, if you optimize to the best, let's say, if you inform to the best that you can, your, your matrices, everything left, Everything else that is left is something else. Yes. Uh, and, and it would be, I think it would be extremely important to understand what, what it is. And also if these ingredients that we're not considering have been changing over time. So it could be, for example, seasonal factors. But, but given the same seasonal factors, you may have anyway two regions behaving differently. And I don't think there is a lot of uh, understanding there, not even a lot of results. So it would be definitely some, some place where to, to start looking into open room for improvements. Okay, so if no other questions uh, present are there, I would probably close the session here. Thank you again, Vittoria. Thanks a lot for your contribution today. I guess it was very, very important also to clear up our mind on this complex matter. And so all the best for your work. And uh, Thank you. Uh, okay, see you. And um, thanks a lot to everyone. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.